Welcome to Money Matters TV. My name is Paul Mitchell. I'm a commercial banker. I'm your host for this show. Join me is my co-host, James Chan. He's the owner of Asian Marketing Company, et cetera, et cetera. He's been uh, working in the Asian consulting business for 30, 40, 50 something, something years. Well, not that bad, not that long. But close. I began in 1983, so long okay. enough, long 30 enough. some years. Okay, mm -hmm. very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, and your background is you, you, you're, you're Chinese. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hope so. That's my belief. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, mean, I think that's probably what your birth certificate says, <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, right. <laughs> and not only that, China was my academic study. I mean, I got my PhD in Chinese studies, in Chinese geography. So, not mm -hmm. only because I have the right skin color, I right. also have academic credentials. And your credentials. But that's why I have enough of a goal yeah. <laughs> to talk to be yeah. a China expert. And your, and your, uh, your degrees are in? The U.S. Uh, the University of Michigan in yes. Ann Arbor. Sure, sure. PhD, class of nineteen seventy-seven. Yeah. Well, China as an economic force these days is, besides being in the news a lot, mm -hmm. I mean, it is a real big, big issue. I mean, they're, uh, you know, it's, a, it's the second largest economy now. Um, it seems like um, you know, ten, twenty, thirty years ago, people in this country really didn't understand what was going on there. You see a stamp said something said made in China, and that was kind of like a, a question mark. Well, I mean, t t well, you have to understand, Paul, from 1949, when China turned communist, to 1979, a period of 30 years, mm -hmm. 49, 79, yeah, yeah. easy to remember, the U.S. and China were enemies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were enemies. The end of World no, War II and no all that trade, type of stuff. Yeah, no trade. No trade. Wow. Bad press, mm -hmm. fake news, mm -hmm. what have you. I speak ill of you. Mm -hmm. You well, speak ill of me. communism. I mean, the U.S. did not like communists. Yeah. So how? So so Cold really, War, sure. China didn't really open up and mm -hmm. start working with the U.S. Mm -hmm. until 1979. Mm -hmm. And when China first opened up, to answer your question, China had no money. China, the all of China mm -hmm. had only five billion dollars worth of foreign currencies. Uh, reserve because mm -hmm. Chinese money was not uh, at that time Yang, and still Yang, is Yang, not Yang. Mm -hmm. convertible. You're a banker, you know, it's not mm -hmm. convertible mm -hmm. because it's not convertible. You have to look at US dollars, yeah. you know, as real currency. Right. So in 1980, 81, when I started out uh, in my export business, mm -hmm. uh, China had no money. That's what you well, were trying to say, or you were yeah, trying to ask well, me, right? And, and, and to, to go forward a little bit, I mean, communism by definition is not is the opposite of capitalism. Capitalism is the creation of, of private wealth. Mm -hmm. Communism, the idea is that no no individual should have any wealth. It's all for the good of uh, of, of everybody. Wow. But now, and you know, we read about billionaires mm -hmm. in, in China. Right. We read about uh, this gross national product, yeah, which right. is second to the yeah. U.S. Right. It's, it's, it's a big thing. So how can, this hap how can this happen in a communist country like that? I hope people don't have that mindset, because if they look at China still as a communist country, which it is, mm -hmm. they're looking at it the wrong way. Meaning, you just communism is just another name that happens to be very convenient for the Chinese. Mm -hmm. It's the result of history. China as a nation, as a culture, has always been a pragmatic, mm -hmm. money-operated, mm -hmm. coin-operated culture. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it that way, then you won't be shocked. Well, but still, you said that you know, just a few few decades ago, there was hardly any money mm -hmm. in in China, mm -hmm. and the gross national product apparently was was pretty small. It wasn't yeah. a um, it's anything it was that, the US, that the U.S. that the U.S. had to deal with. I think you had a you had a chart that you had showed me earlier yeah. showing the uh, the trade deficit that did not exist at all until what year was that? Well, that was in for the U.S. part in the mm -hmm. United States. Mm -hmm. America had no trade deficit, no zero, with anybody. close to zero okay. before 1975 for wow. decades and yeah. decades before 1975. 1975 was the last year when the U.S. had a small trade surplus mm -hmm. in trading with all other countries. Which means we shipped more from this country than we imported from others. Even, not shipped more, no more, no less, yeah. even, right. even yeah. well, flat. I'm just if you look at that chart, right. flat, till 1975. Mm -hmm. And beginning from 1975, it goes 
down and up again and then way down. And we are now in the way down period. Because we're importing and sending more money to we China. We buy more than, than we sell. We consume mm -hmm. more uh, than right. we uh, manufacture. Uh, and it's a very complex issue. Yeah, one of the things I, I find complex is that uh, I know this country has kept statistics for economic output mm -hmm. in various sectors and that type of thing for, for decades, since the, uh, I'll say at least the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. How long has China been doing that? Oh, measuring, new, measuring, measuring their, their well, the Chinese yeah. like to measure, but on the other hand, uh, now I have to go back to the concept of communism because a lot of statistics are really commandeered by the central government, mm -hmm. by layers and yes, layers yes. of bureaucracy. And I have, over the past 30 some, mm -hmm. 34 years, 36 years, talking with Chinese people, as I go there mm. or as I am on the phone, I have Chinese customers and friends who keep telling me, don't trust the numbers, <laughs> the fake numbers, fake, fake statistics. Fake. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> oh, and they're very gleeful telling me that. Uh -huh. They're yeah. not being cynical, uh -huh. no. Right. So, next question, <laughs> next question, <laughs> Paul. Other than the... Uh, well, we do have a question from one of our viewers. Okay. Right along these lines, I think right. it'd be very apropos. Right. Lewis Martin of Philadelphia asks, what kind of products does China need? Oh, wow. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, legitimate question. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a simple one, but I think it's one of the most difficult <laughs> ones to answer. Let me do my best. Mm -hmm. Let me give a short, concrete answer. And maybe I should say not only products, but services, services should be too. part of that question. Right. China needs everything, uh, however, uh, to be very specific, China needs a lot of raw materials, a lot of uh, raw materials, uh, agricultural products, uh, for one reason. Going back to your earlier question, China has been able to amass a big fortune doing business because when it first opened up, it really didn't have money. Mm -hmm. And it really couldn't buy much. Uh, and so if you had no money, you couldn't buy much. How would you survive? How would you grow and prosper? Mm -hmm. Well, the Chinese, really smart and, and, and quite, quite strategic, came up with the idea, well, we can be the world's assembler. Mm. Service. Assembler. There's a service. Assembler. Yeah. What, does, what do I mean by right. assembler? Sure. Well, we will, in the, in the Chinese uh, phrase, lai liao jia gong, lai liao, to import, to bring in mm -hmm. liao, meaning raw materials. Mm -hmm. And jia gong is to add our labor. In other words, we have nothing. We have right, nothing. Right. So we can import raw materials. And parts. Uh, and parts, and then we will add labor, just mm -hmm. like the iPhone, good mm -hmm. example. Yeah. iPhone is assembled, mm -hmm. assembler, China being right. the assembler. Chi the, the, self, the iPhone is assembled in China and the Chinese get only $5 in terms of a cell phone selling mm -hmm. for $650 or $700. Right, right, right. However, right. $5 yeah. is better than zero. Yeah. <laughs> so and or in re more recent years, that uh, $5 has become Six, seven dollars, and oh, now sure. now people are buying right. cars and right. furs and right. polo shirts right. and whatever. So, so to answer the the viewers, yes. uh, Lewis, I think it's Lewis Martin. To yes. answer Lewis' question, really, uh, China needs a lot. Uh, of raw materials because mm -hmm. it doesn't have. China needs the soybeans because it lacks enough right. cultivable That's land right. yeah. to feed a large population. Uh -huh. It needs pork, it needs cell phone parts, yeah. you know, because there are certain sophisticated precision engineer right. parts and components. Yeah. Yeah. Like in a cell phone, there are at least 14 parts made in different places in America mm -hmm. that the Chinese cannot make. Wow. Cannot. Fascinating. And then, of course, in terms of the uh, uh, not just 14 parts, China contributes something like maybe eight parts that are made in China, but then there will be one part made in Germany, one part made in South mm. Korea, mm. one part, uh, maybe two or three parts and components made by the United Kingdom. Yep. And then that's why if the current administration is to hit China with a, a, a stiff or punitive mm. tariff, right. 
it will affect not just China because there are other countries yeah. that are contributing parts, just like an iPhone. Right. And so in a way, by, by, by increasing tariff, it stirs up the whole pool. There is a, a chart also that uh, yeah. I have included in this talk, which is by the online magazine Axios, mm -hmm. A-X-I-O-S, Axios. Um, and it uh, shows you a, a graph of the imports from a lot of countries. Mm -hmm. It's think of like a like a jigsaw puzzle, rectangular, like a Mondrian uh, picture with squares and mm -hmm. rectangles. Each square and rectangle represent a nation, and it also and the sizes represent how much of that universal yeah. rectangle that China imports. But China imports products, raw materials from so many different countries, so that so that if we hit China with a 25% tariff increase, mm -hmm. we're actually hitting everybody, yeah, yeah. including our own businesses. It's a global economy, it's a global world. They call it supply it. chain, sure, that's really sure. what it yeah, means. Yeah, fascinating. Well, uh, well, uh, Lewis, um, I think you got a, quite an answer there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long answer. And it's not, it's not even uh, uh, done However, yet. before <laughs> I end, Lewis' question, as I said, is very basic, very important. But the real way of getting rich from the Chinese market is not by selling what the Chinese need. We have to sell what the Chinese want. Mm, right. Remember the sure. Rolling Stones? Well, you can't always get what yeah. you want, yeah. but if you try, you may get <laughs> what you need. No, no, need is fine, but it's what you want. Yeah. China can produce its own red wine, but if you have a particular red wine that has a certain taste, a certain class, mm. yeah. you, you sell it, people want it. Right. So they cannot easily replace you. Yeah. See, soybean is what China needs, however, China can also buy soybean from Brazil, not yeah. just from America. Yeah. China may need certain microchips produced mm -hmm. by certain U.S. companies. However, if we stop and we're already telling a Chinese mm -hmm. company, ZTE, mm -hmm. we're not going to sell you any microchips because yeah. you're such a bad boy. Yeah. <laughs> the, Chinese, the Chinese can get it from the Germans, yeah. from the Japanese, yeah. from, the, from the British. So in a way, that's a need. We should sell China what the Chinese want. And this is how you can send your question in to Money Matters TV. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, send us your questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, T-V dot com. Kelly Stewart, who is CEO and founder of The Positive Business. Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. So, great name of your company and all. Um, How'd you get in, into this business? What is The Positive Business? The Positive Business is a service I launched in January to help business owners and other company leaders learn how to become more purpose-driven, socially conscious, and environmentally aware in their companies. Socially conscious, what do you mean by that? Well, it's around this concept of doing well by doing good in business mm -hmm. and addressing some of the social concerns of today, which range on a continuum from being again, socially conscious and responsible to a socially driven enterprise. And mm -hmm. an example of that would be Tom's Shoes, which um, for every pair of shoes you purchase, they donate a pair of shoes to oh. someone and across a, the world. And there's a sock company that's doing the same thing. Now. Yes, <laughs> yes there is, absolutely. And al actually the United States is um, one of the best places to be a social entrepreneur. So mm -hmm. social entrepreneurship is actually on the rise in this country. Well, here's another example I, I, I read about recently um, on the internet. Uh, the best whole wheat bread. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's made by a company, and I forget the name of the company, I don't want to promote them anyway, but um, the company looks to employ former prisoners. Absolutely. Does, th does that fit in with that yes, thing? Yes, that's about re reducing recidivism. There are many companies mm -hmm. um, that are starting to do that, and it's working for them. So it's profitable, because that's still what we're talking about, mm -hmm. and, um, and it's helping to address a social need. 
And I, I know of a, a woman who works with a company that does just that, and her family has the company, and she explained it to me very easily. She said, it's like anything else, Kelly. Once you make the decision to do something, you just put a plan around it. Mm -hmm. She said, so people who don't hire second chance employ employees, mm -hmm. their plan, number th the number one thing on their plan is do a background check. She said, that's not on our plan. She says, we have other things on our plan, but mm -hmm. not that. So that's a perfect example of mm -hmm. how businesses now are kind of expanding their definition of success mm -hmm. to look at all of their stakeholders. I think that's a fabulous idea to be willing to hire ex, you know, mm -hmm. uh, prisoners uh, mm -hmm. because uh, there was one business network session where I was, uh, where I heard that a lot of trucking companies needed truckers, yes. but they could not find enough. And I asked the, the person why, and he said, well, because they have records. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's kind of sad, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it really, it, it impacts the economy. The yes. ripple effect right. is really there, uh, right. especially if you look at some of the younger offenders who maybe, you know, they were just at the wrong place, wrong time, not necessarily, you know, filled with the criminal intent of a mm -hmm. criminal mastermind, but you know, it does, it precludes them really from entering uh, the job market for the rest of their lives. And so I think that's what some of these companies are trying to address. Is this also an example of why you call your business the positive business? Is it part of the positive it idea, is. the theme? It is. And, um, the, one of the challenges in the shift in this way business is being done is there isn't always a common vocabulary. And so for me, the positive business represented an, an umbrella term under which values-based, impact-minded, socially responsible, all of this fits into this for benefit corporations. And, um, but the positive business actually um, comes out of the University of Michigan. They have the Ross School of Business and yeah. they have the Center for Positive Organizations there, mm -hmm. which is where they have spent several decades studying what it means to be positive in business, mm -hmm. which is having a mindset where you, you know, uh, build on your strengths instead of trying to always fix what's broken. Mm -hmm. You stretch beyond your goals, you know, so that you're, you're looking to, to exceed expectations. You're looking to always build your capacity mm -hmm. in this example. Right. then an organization can still build the capacity. They're tapping into a labor market mm -hmm. that's available to them and also helping to reduce recidivism. Mm -hmm. And then you strive for excellence and goodness for goodness sake. And, right. um, and that's the, the element of positivity that I find to be a common thread through all types of organizations that mm -hmm. seek to do well by doing yeah. good. So that's where the positive business came from. Now, I, I'm a, I'm a, I always have a little, little cloud over my head being a, being a banker and being an investment banker sure. and a financer and, and that type of thing. So I can understand how this could be applicable to entrepreneurial companies, people that have their own company, they're the ones that are doing, you know, making everything happen, making all, really all the decisions, that type of thing. And they're responsible really basically to them, themselves, accountable to themselves. Mm -hmm. But a public company, mm -hmm. how, does, how can a public company rationalize that positive approach when they're, they're judged by the earnings of uh, the last quarter and, and that type of thing. Sure. Not to be Fair in, in, in anything that it might impact, and make the, 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 the bigger profit struggle a little bit. Mm -hmm. Be positive, for example, that might be a little, nips away at their effort to make more money. How do they rationalize that? Well, they? In a, yeah, they do. It's a great question. I'm really glad that you asked it because there's a couple of different ways of looking at this. I mentioned this common vocabulary, right, is, um, is a challenge when, when you talk about these types of businesses. In the financial world, they really talk less about value-based and impact and social responsible, and they talk more about environmental and social governance strategies and performances. So what they're saying is that they acknowledge that in fact, recently now, uh, the longitudinal research that's been done on this is out. So they've been looking at companies over the last 18 to 20 years and saying that the companies that do good actually do well over the long term. Mm -hmm. And I just um, read a statistic recently, now over one quarter of the world's professionally managed assets include an ESG strategy within them, which represents about $23 e trillion. Dollars. Environmental, social, and governance. Okay. So it's saying these are the publicly traded companies that are doing something good for the environment, mm -hmm. something good for society, mm -hmm. and they're rather transparent. Their governance is uh, rather transparent, mm -hmm. and they're accountable for the decisions that they make. Mm -hmm. 
So under the whole, the part, the word positive mm -hmm. is the idea of companies wanting to be more loyal to their employees. All of their stakeholders. And really what it is, is um, it's, it's expanding. We're still talking about for-profit companies, right? right? So mm -hmm. we're still talking about capitalism. Yes. So it's about expanding that notion that you are, the, the company is only making a profit to improve the lives of its shareholders. Mm -hmm to say we will still do that because people who have a financial stake in our company should be rewarded for the mm -hmm. confidence and faith right. they have. That's why they've put right. their money in. Right. But we're also going to do work for the benefit of all of our stakeholders. Okay. So that's the clients, the employees, the mm -hmm. vendors, the supply chain right. you were talking about earlier. Right. And realizing that we're all part of a larger ecosystem right. that when, when one area is affected over here, the ripple effect comes through it. And so that's what they're looking to do. Um, and then that even extends to your local community. You know, um, how are you a good community neighbor? Mm -hmm. um, are you spending on local suppliers? And then it involves the planet. We're talking about the, the, um, the parts uh, yeah. in, in, yeah. the, in the cell phone yeah. earlier. Yeah. And you know, when people think about it being environmentally friendly in businesses, they think certainly about managing their eco-waste mm -hmm. responsibly, mm -hmm. you know, reducing their mm -hmm. water and energy uses. Mm -hmm. It actually takes an inordinate amount of water to process the semiconductor chips oh. because of the silicon. So, you know, there's this is, as we've said earlier, and I've heard you say it earlier on the show, it's complex mm -hmm. and it's different for every company. Right. So the publicly traded companies can do it. It's just on such a larger scale that it happens a little bit more slowly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they start with one division and it trickles down from there. Mm -hmm. and the most recent example of that is uh, this notion of a benefit corporation. Yeah. Right. Talk a little bit more about that. Sure. A benefit corporation is also one known as a B Corp. A B Corp, right? That's its other moniker, B Corps. And um, what they do is they have verifiable environmental and social business practices. Verifiable is important. Mm -hmm. So the, it, somebody can come in and say, yes, they're actually doing what they say that they're doing, right? right? And they. Um, in those cases, we've mentioned a couple of those things. They're spending on local suppliers, they're bringing out the best in their team, they are um, checking, making sure that their supply chain is not only healthy, but maybe isn't doing anything that's against their values, so they're investigating that. They're making responsible decisions for the planet. And because they have a stated mission of that that's part of their everyday business practices, which is what separates it a little bit from corporate social responsibility, it's woven into what they do, then they can be very accountable for their actions. And then they're very comfortable being transparent about it. So the B Corp is, mm -hmm. we have an environmental and social initiatives that are part of our everyday business practices. We're, we're accountable for those and we're transparent about it. So if you are a B Corp yourself, you're a service business. You can be a service business or you don't a have, You don't have parts to environmentally right. dispose of, right, th things like that. How do you, how right. do you uh, change your, Absolutely. Different, different than the next well, service even, company? Exactly, even as a um, solopreneur, right, and, and which I am right now, um, I can look at the way I manage my own waste in my office space, right? So theoretically, your smallest bin is for the landfill, your mid-sized bin mm -hmm. is for the recycle, and then you compost as much as you can. I can align my the way I give back to my business strategically. And um, the the under um, underpinning of B Corps is their nonprofit, B Labs. They're the ones that do the quantitative analysis and assessment of companies to make sure that they're hitting those practices. So you're, you're paying them a fee? So I, I'm not, but I could contribute to them oh. as part of my social giving because I'm behind the idea of mm. businesses being a force for good, mm. right? So um, uh, strategically aligning your business to how you want to give back. Employees, if you have them, pay the living wage, offer the benefits, mm. and mm. if you can't offer the, the benefits, the primary benefits, then um, you know to offer the supplemental benefits. Mm -hmm. So those are, are types of things that companies can do even as a service business. It's for every size and type of organization. When was the concept created and who did it? Sure. Um, B Labs has been around since 2006. Mm -hmm. And um, as I understand it, the people behind that were very instrumental in the development of the And One company, which was, I believe oh, yeah. it was basketball apparel, right? 
and um, to, to make a fortune, by the way. And, so, they, and, they, and they did very well, apparently. And so <laughs> they started this. I, you know, I don't know them personally, but they they started this organization from that. I think the shift in business, though, really started towards um, right before the turn of the century. You know, we were, and that was when John Elkington, who is a leading authority on sustainable development, mm -hmm. he really kind of made the statement that concern for society and the, and the environment can coexist with an ambition for profits. And that really sums all of this mm -hmm. movement up. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. So w why does this all matter to the financial community, which I'm part of and yeah. James is kind of, kind of, yeah, I mean, sorry, you know, uh, right. <laughs> Absolutely. He's a very graceful person. <laughs> Transparent. Uses Transparent. the most charming <laughs> language to add something poignant Absolutely. And <laughs> like, Kelly, get ready. I am not afraid. <laughs> so it is important, and I think part of what we talked about earlier, the I, I think, and I'm not in finance, so you can all tell me if I'm misguided in this, but I think that when it is a proven over 18, 20 years that a company that's doing good is doing well. That's what investors are looking for. And yes. my understanding is investors don't like a lot of surprises. Mm -hmm. And so this is a way to really manage that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they've been able to measure it prior to 20 years ago. There just weren't as many companies out there doing this. Yeah. And now there are more. And now we're seeing that the not only do the institutional investors understand, oh, this is wonderful, right? We've got good mm -hmm. performance over the long term, but they're clamoring now to keep up with investment from individual investors. More um, of the, actually, Goldman Sachs did a survey on this a couple of years ago, but investors in every age group from 18 to 75 are mm -hmm. willing to take a little bit more risk to invest in companies they believe in. And if you take that one step further, then the individual investor wants to support companies that are doing well and, and you know, uh, addressing the, the social mm -hmm. concerns that they have. The, the glitch has been in how do we know for sure who right. are those companies? Mm -hmm. right. And that, I think, is a, a fabulous need that B Labs is beating and B Corporation because they B Labs does that verifiable. Mm -hmm. They're the third party verification. Yeah. Well, we've certainly been reading about some companies that apparently uh, weren't um, didn't have ethical values or yeah. whatever you want to call yeah, it, as, as, as some people that. thought. Um, I was about yes. to say and, uh, that. And yeah. so the negative, um, and, and negative and impact on their and brand. And kind of a Absolutely. little bit of neurolinguistic B benefit. Yes. You can have the bad boys of business, so they're the B too. <laughs> right, <laughs> bad exactly. Boys, bad girls, <laughs> same, you know, badness <laughs> exactly. is equal opportunity. Well, I think that's yeah. one of the drivers of, of right. all of this change too, is technology. Through right. the internet, we have more access I to information see. than we could yeah, have dreamed sure. possible 50 years ago. We have social networking, so people are more connected, bad mm -hmm. news travels quickly, and we have citizen journalism. So now that headline gets out to literally millions, if not billions of people almost automatically. So companies now that really try to still operate under the notion of a brand image mm -hmm. and um, you know, where maybe what they're doing on the front end is a little different from what's happening on the back end or if they're fluffing up their, their websites with what they say they do or believe mm -hmm. in, they do that at their own peril now. And yeah. that's some of those unexpected surprises that sure. I think the investors yeah. don't yeah. like. So yeah. this is a way mm -hmm. of... Mm -hmm. As, as, as we wrap up our interview, we, we could go on for, for a long time, very, very interesting, it's fascinating. But two questions. One, sure. so if our viewers would want to contact you, how would they do that? And number two, if they wanted to find out more about the B Corp sure. and, and, B, and positive way of running businesses, mm -hmm. what's a good resource uh, for them to go Absolutely. to? Absolutely. I'll start with your second question first. Um, to get more information about B Corp, they can go to bcorp.net online mm -hmm. and learn more about them there. There are other organizations such as Conscious Capitalism, the Sustainable Business Network of Philadelphia. These are all great organizations to learn more, the Center for Positive Organizations. And to contact me, they can go to thepositivebusiness.com. Okay, terrific. Kelly, fascinating. Thank you so much for Thank all you this so new much. information. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James. So that wraps up our, our show. And I uh, just want to leave with one thought in the, the minds of our audience is that on this show, your money matters. <laughs>